Um, the subject is EA Next, Next Generation Enterprise Architecture for the Digital Age. So uh, our presenters are Randy Potter, who's Senior Director, EA Practice North America for Capgemini. Randy leads a team of EAs to advise Fortune 500 clients on their digital transformation initiatives, innovation, and the impact of new technology on their business. And Dana Prakash Ponasamy, Enterprise Architect, Digital Acceleration Center, Capgemini India. Gnana has more than 17 years of IT experience in various architect roles, such as enterprise architect, digital solution architect, delivery architect, and technical architect. In this session, they'll look at the next generation enterprise architecture for the digital age. Uh, gentlemen, a warm welcome from the open group, Randy Potter and Gan Prakash Panasami. Over to you, gentlemen. All right, thank you, Steve. So real quickly, let's uh, jump into it. Um, it's fairly fortuitous that we actually come last because the last four, pres four or five presentations um, really get uh, consolidated into what we're gonna talk about here. Um, this, this idea of the next generation architecture came about about a little over two years ago. Um, and several years ago, there was this topic of VUCA, right, that started running around, the idea of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Um, but there weren't good answers to how to address that, particularly from an architectural perspective. So a lot of what we started to do two years ago is to put together some ideas on how to address that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go go to the next slide here. And you know, at a at an overarching level, there were really three areas that we started to focus on. One was the idea of anti-fragile architecture, and I'll spend some time on that in just a minute. Um, agile architecture, which we've already heard a little bit about, but I'll talk about that particularly in the, in the context of uh, digital first and digital transformations. And then Prakash will talk about architecture automation. And um, those are really the three pillars this stands on. We took those ideas, baked them into our uh, current enterprise architecture maturity assessment which is based on uh, TOGAF 9.2, plus some uh, inner learnings from Capgemini. And then we've also added these uh, kind of three additional pillars. So, you know, what, what was discussed in just the prior session about automation, um, can't stress that enough just because we, we've got to be able to go a lot faster than we do today, right? So real quick, I'm gonna do, oh, well, this will be real quick. Um, Anti-fragile architecture principles, um, some of these will be familiar just from a pure architectural perspective, but this all really came together uh, two years ago based on a book from uh, Nassim Tlaib. Um, he wrote a book in 2012 called Anti-Fragile, um, and it's about all kinds of different systems, not necessarily computer systems at all. Um, he talks about politics and government, um, you know, and, and almost any kind of thing. But anti-fragile is not what you typically think of in terms of, uh, we normally think of resilient systems or robust. Anti-fragile is actually something that improves with stress and time. Um, so, you know, that'd be a neat trick if you could do that with architecture um, all the way through your build and run, right? So we started looking into that. One of the key things that um, this starts with is the idea of increasing your options. Um, if you if you, some of you may be familiar with an ERP package that um, a few years ago decided to deprecate um, their, you know, one of their largest packages and kind of force people to move up to the next version uh, within like about five years, which many of our clients have millions and millions of lines of uh, code customizing this ERP package. And frankly, that, um, that, threw them for quite a loop. Um, some of, most of them got you know, pretty upset about it, to tell you the truth. Um, but what had happened was the clients, they had basically painted themselves into a corner. If they had done things differently, it would not be as painful to do the upgrade. Um, and, and, it's, and when I call it an upgrade, I wouldn't really actually call it an upgrade. It's like a, it's a combination migration and rebuild. Now, if they had incorporated some fairly simple principles that we're gonna talk about here, uh, they could have avoided a lot of that. Um, a good example of, uh, of creating options for yourself from an architectural perspective is 
uh, leveraging something as simple as uh, APIs. So if I'm doing APIs on my systems and sometime in the future I decide that I want to do something different with that system or I want to provide different access to that system, that becomes actually pretty easy. I have built-in future options that I don't even know about today. Um, so that's just one simple example. Um, but that's an important one. Um, the next one is stressing the system. So from an anti-fragile perspective, if you think about um, like the human body, right? If you sit around like me for the last three months um, in this office in my house, not doing anything, um, your body starts to get pretty fragile. But if you get up and you work out and you, you know, stress your body um, to some, you know, limited amounts of pain, hopefully, uh, then you get stronger. And that's the idea here with stressing the system. Um, in 20, I think it was about 2010, I believe Netflix had a major outage. And um, they decided to replan the way that they think about their systems. And one of the things they did is they decided that we've got to actually try to test things and break things in production to see what happens because a system that big, they can't, they don't have a realistically um, similar system in, for a quality assurance uh, or a, or a, or a pre-production environment. And so they came up with something called um, uh, Chaos Monkey. And Chaos Monkey is basically, it's, a, it's an approach and a plan for being able to um, plan and execute uh, breakage um, in the production system. Now, the important part is you need to be able to manage that safely so that you're not uh, taking out users. Um, so that's, that's there's a, and there's other systems too. Gremlin's another one that you can do that with. But it's important to architect the system so that it, so that you can stress it in production, right? And then the next one is similar to that, is build for recovery, not failure. So typically in the past, we've tried to build systems that cannot fail. The problem is, is when they do fail, they usually fail rather dramatically. Um, there's a, you know, I can think of a, a particular airline a few years ago had a fairly major outage and it took days to get back online. Um, and because one particular part of that system wasn't as robust as the rest of it. Um, and they don't, you know, and it, and it wasn't well, te well tested in production, I'll put it that way. And then the next one is distributed versus centralized. So if you think about centralized systems, uh, the danger with that is, is if that goes down, then you're down. Uh, now you can have a, you can have essentially a centralized system from a, um, from an infrastructure perspective, but at least your, your um, uh, services need to be uh, distributed and robust. Um, easy way to think about that one is microservices um, and containers and being able to run that. Another way to think about it from an infrastructure perspective is uh, from a, you know, the, the whole cloud industry and how they build um, their, their data centers and to be able to um, you know, fail over to a completely different data center and, and building in the, the, the capability for that. So all of this, these are what we would call our anti fragile architecture principles and building those into uh, the capabilities that we that we uh, implement. And then agile architecture, which has already been talked about a couple of times today, um, but really thinking about this in terms of, you know, iterative architecture, uh, MVA or minimal viable architecture. I've also heard it called uh, minimal value architecture. Um, but if the idea is rather than boil the ocean for my current state and then, you know, think about design the future state and then start doing all my transitions over the next five years, um, instead of doing that, do an iterative approach focusing on change, um, focusing on the customer experience. So you wouldn't want to do that exclusively. It's not just about the, you know, the front office systems or the front end systems, um, but it's, it's, that's a good place to start. And when you're right now, what part of what uh, prompted a lot of this is all the digital transformation that's going on in our industry. And people, you know, um, it was said in one of the sessions previous to this, the, all of that digital transformation and those digital journeys are adding complexity to the current IT landscape. And so um, focusing on that and how it integrates then into your back office is a good place to start. Um, integration isn't just about um, the way we typically think about integration of systems. 
but it's also integration with the business. And um, the, the the prior session that um, from Mega that talked about, um, you know, really looking at business outcomes. Um, part of what Agile does is it embeds business into the process. Um, so you've got a product owner who's supposed to be from the business, and they're supposed to be injecting that direction and value from a business perspective um, into everything from the, the scrum teams to your planned increments, et cetera. So that's two areas of focus around integ integration is that back office back into your legacy systems, or I'm sorry, the front office into the back office but also integration with the business, which leads to the next point, and that was talked about earlier as well, is enterprise architects uh, can't just sit in the ivory tower, produce standards, and sit on the uh, you know, architecture review board and shoot, shoot things down just because they don't, they don't meet some 250-page you know, standard that uh, they've been, the solution architects has been directed to follow. They need to, the enterprise architects need to be in those program increments um, that are going on, which is usually a quarterly planning exercise, but they need to be in that. There's certain um, reviews that they need to be a part of to make sure that things are staying on track. And it's a two-way street. Um, part of that is that those leads to the next point, which gives them the opportunity to consult and guide, not just produce standards, but to actually consult and guide on that. But it also is a feedback loop being in those um, lower level. Um, some, you know, I wouldn't say you have to go to every scrum meeting every day. Definitely, you have to have too many EAs to make that possible. But you do need to be in the program in increments and the reviews. Um, so when you do the, the you know, uh, sprint reviews and you're going through those, you're going to get feedback um, that you're going to hear that you wouldn't otherwise. And then lastly is um, tools and frameworks. Uh, so, you know, uh, this, was, this was talked about a couple of times already, and that is integrating your tools and frameworks from an EAM perspective with those Agile tools and making sure that, you know, both of them are kind of bi-directional and feeding each other. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Prakash to talk about automation. Thanks, Randy. Hello, everyone. So as part of the EA Next, I would like to take you towards what kind of automation options available and how to get started into EA Next journey. Architecture automation is about automate the certain enterprise architecture activities such as current state architecture assessment at business application and technology architecture level and incorporate enterprise architecture frameworks with the meta model and standards and uh, uh, leverage the existing available accelerators at organizational level. Let's look at those one by one. Nowadays, the modern EA tools having additional more features than modeling, like even in a couple of uh, previous uh, presentations we have seen about, like uh, such as strategic transformation management, portfolio management, technology asset management. So those are all the additional features that has been captured in that modern EA tools. Industry analysts such as Gartner and Forrester predicted that by 2023, 60% of EA tools will become intelligent and 60% of EA practice will be intelligence into their business and the operating models. To see, to see the realization of these predictions nowadays, EA tools started implementing more practice. In our case study, that use case, we have used Arbus I server as an uh, enterprise architecture repository and leverage that product features to implement that automation part. When we engage with the big uh, digital transformation, getting to know about business capability and process from existing enterprise ERP systems is essential. The modern EA tools has built in features in forms of plugins or uh, API integration to get those business process in BPM and standard and populated into enterprise architecture, which helps the business executives and stakeholders, stakeholders start defining or redefine the business process from EA tools, which becomes a kind of a uh, front, -end, front ending tool for the business stakeholders instead of where they have a kind of a restriction access enterprise application systems and sync back to that sync back to that enterprise application. In that way, the dynamic hey, changes are the 
Professor, your audio <laughs> is kind of flaking in and out. Um, you might want to just slow down a little bit and make sure you're as clear as possible on your end. Okay. Is it fine now? In some cases, the asset and the process information like uh, will be stored as an, a configuration item in CMDB data sources, such as service now. So modern EA tools have plugins to sync, sync up those informations also into EA repository. Some of the plugins are the, some of the product features which not compatible with that uh, current CMDB sources. Uh, that EA, that uh, EA tools has some sort of an flexibility to import based on that uh, Excel-based uh, process. In some cases, the application level information will be retained in the application portfolio management tools. These information will be essential when we take the decision for digital transformation. So this also can be integrated into EA repository. So in order to accommodate the information we retrieved from the all the resources, all the all sources, we cannot rely on the single framework standard and moreover, we cannot use the framework standard as is. It requires the tailored uh, updations or the tailored customizations to meet that customer's uh, meta model requirements. In that case, it has been extended with a combination of multiple frameworks like uh, TOGOF with the big framework standard and uh, additional meta models uh, to depict about the APS services, along with that industry reference architecture. Like in one of our uh, 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 client example for the telecom industry, we have integrated TOGOF, BPM, and standard, along with that uh, reference architecture from EM Forum. So overall, the enterprise architecture repository becomes the center source for all enterprise information, and this automation approach will ensure that information available on enterprise architecture repository is up to date. Now we just look into that EA maturity assessment. Randy, can you just move to the next slide? So now uh, you might get some idea about anti-fragile principles. Agile architecture and uh, architecture automation. Now let's have a look how to conduct an assessment about where we are on that A next stop. So this is the uh, yeah, uh, assessment like assessment approach diagram in which we have a uh, assessment on EA strategy like about uh, value case and mandate for the role of enterprise architecture within the organization principles and constraints as just few minutes before Andy briefed about that architecture. Competency and capability. This is, a, it is a community of a com competent enterprise and project level architects supported by appropriate training and accreditation schemes, governance and assurance, community and culture. It is the corporate culture aware and the application of enterprise architecture in all change initiatives as we just captured Agile architecture part few minutes before. Architecture content, it is a comprehensive and integrated description of current and future state of business operation and supporting information systems and technology infrastructure landscape. As just before, we just captured with that uh, in, in what way of customize the meta model to capture those information in an automated way with the uh, right set of uh, or the right EA repository. Then final one is about uh, framework method and tools. It is a robust, scalable and sustainable framework and method with supporting tools for architecture development and its ongoing maintenance. As just covered, kind of the process and methods to generate that uh, EA repository, as well as uh, preparing that uh, uh, documentation approach and that integration approach with that uh, from that existing uh, enterprise applications in order to make that EA repository. This helps to adapt and uh, yeah. next. Thanks everyone, over to Andy. All right, thanks Prakash. Um, I'm gonna go back to this slide. One of the things that, um, one of the interesting automations um, that we, we're using a tool called Orbis iServer. 
Uh, but one of the really interesting automations is to automatically generate diagrams um, and to enable people who are just using Microsoft products to, to leverage those. So um, that was the automation side of this was really important. Obviously, um, as was spoken about before, having that centralized repository um, is as important, especially for reuse. We have 8,000 certified architects around the globe. And so being able to, you know, A, capture some of that information um, and be able to reuse some of those artifacts and mix and match them um, is a big deal. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip over to our conclusion. Um, you know, obviously things are, you know, the, the whole idea around VUCA is, uh, you know, volatile, uncertainty, um, complexity and ambiguity. That's not new. The difference is that it's happening so fast. And, you know, we just had a, at least one black swan event, which was uh, COVID-19, um, that really threw a wrench into everybody's thinking for uh, the year 2020. This will definitely be one year it'll go down in the history books. Um, so going forward, we're talking about uh, we need to be future proof, um, and that's where anti fragile comes in. Uh, need to be agile and flexible as enterprise architects. So, that's not just about what kind of architecture you produce, what the artifacts are. As was said earlier, it's critical that what you produce can be used by others. Um, the key thing for an architect to be able to do is communicate, right? Uh, communicate and sometimes translate. Uh, so being able to do that and then automate as much as possible because you just don't have time to build all this stuff by hand. And there's good tools now, uh, particularly in the EAM space, to consume existing products out there and to be able to, you know, basically build a majority of your current state immediately and better yet, um, to be able to refresh that uh, frequently so that you always have an idea of where you really stand versus where you're going. So. Steve, I'll stop there, and uh, we'll take any questions anybody may have. Thank you both very much, gentlemen. Uh, round, of, round of applause if you could hear it, but uh, thank you. It's uh, yeah. Black Swan event is an understatement, isn't it? Um, yes. So um, something that I wanted to uh, to ask you, I re recently saw um, a significant, I'm actually looking for the name of it now, um, a significant um, publication from Capgemini on an EA report that was published either this week or last week. Um, yeah, I think it was actually last month. Um, oh, last month, was it? Okay. Yep. Um, a great piece of work and, and some some interesting things came out of that. One of, one of the things that I took from that was the the key role that enterprise architects are playing in transformation activities. Um, you know, I think the number was 95% said they were key contributors um, to major uh, transformation efforts um, coupled with, you know, and there was, a, there was a but, but we need to be uh, uh, using more agile architecture approaches and lots of the things that you've, that you've talked about here. Are you? I know it's not directly what you've spoken about, but I know quite a few of our audience has seen the uh, seen the report or at least aware of it. Are you um, uh, uh, in your practices? Um, how how does that report change what you're doing, or does it already reflect what you're what you're doing with your customers? Yeah, it's a it's really a reflection of what we're doing. I mean, right. it was about three years ago. Um, really started to notice the impact of digital, you know digital journeys, digital transformation, um, and as was spoken about earlier by one of the other uh, panelists, that that is causing that plus the significant increase in you know, new technologies from IoT to blockchain, um, especially yeah. artificial intelligence, um, all of those things coming together are, are creating a big mess. What happened after the financial crisis in 2008 is that a, a decent number of large enterprises cut their enterprise architecture programs. Mm -hmm. um, and those have, those started coming back strongly probably in about 2014. Right. Um, and you really started to see an increase by 2016 and 17. Um, and there was this need for, we can't do enterprise architecture the same way we used to because it takes too long. Things will have changed by the time we're done. Uh, so yeah, that whole agile architecture approach um, is critical. So we are definitely a reflection of what um, the feedback was from that uh, that report. 
but that yeah. was that was intrinsic information that we already knew and understood before the report. The sure, report was actually a good validation of where we were going. Yeah, no, that, that, that's excellent. Yeah, I mean, what what you just described that that uh, you know, the, the the occasion of a lot of EA practices being being shut down as uh, one of our one of our later presenters, uh, Paul Holman from IBM, uh, does a great presentation talking about uh, that's the latest of the. EA winters, you know, EA goes out of fashion for one reason or another, and then the sun comes out, and uh, you know, it might be a little different, but it's still uh, on the rise and still very important. So, well, what what happened was, and I'll use one client example. I won't mention the client, but uh, a large multi-billion-dollar uh, retailer uh, basically did, you know, they cut their program, yeah. um, and they started doing all this, uh, you know, digital work, especially on the customer front end thing. Um, they started doing some changes on their ERP package and were surprised to find that all of a sudden there were all of these new integrations that they were going to have to do that they didn't expect, like 26 new integrations to the ERP package. Um, and nobody knew that. And it was a multi-million dollar you know, change with a multi-million dollar run factor. So, you know, that's what happens when you're not doing enterprise architecture at all. Right. And you're leaving it up to a solution architect here, one there. Those are the kinds of problems you're going to get. Right. I think I know exactly the uh, retail uh, example that you're talking about. But yes, um, it, it's great, gentlemen. We are we are out of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. But uh, again, thank you very much for your uh, for your uh, uh, thoughts today and uh, and for joining us. Um, so again, round of applause. Thank, thank you. you both.